All right, thank you. Laura's here also. <clears throat> Perfect, so we'll get started now. Uh, the City Council Committee on Public Works and Transportation will come to order. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Councilor Dion? Here. Councilor Pelletier? Here. Chairman Kadeem? Here. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and deemed acknowledgeable and permissible. Um, this will be going out through the Zoom uh, meeting uh, being hosted by um, Fred TV. Uh, so I just want to, uh, in advance, uh, ask everybody to kind of bear with us as we go through these uh, comment periods uh, during these items as obviously this is uncharted territory for all these Zoom meetings. So I know some of the councilors have done this in the past, uh, but we're not second nature yet. So we're, we're getting there. So please just bear with us. And I'm sure there'll be uh, some technical difficulties uh, as we go through this, but we'll get through them. So uh, item number one on the agenda is citizen input. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have anything that was submitted? No, we do not. Okay. <laughs> Item number two is the street opening request from the city engineer for pavement less than five years old at 807 Plymouth Ave. This was referred to us back in September of 20, uh, September 24th, 2019. Who, uh, Councilor Dion? Yeah, um, I believe I saw that this street actually um, was done in 2015. So at this point it would be five years. Uh, so, it wouldn't, so it wouldn't be for less than the five year to open a, a street? That is correct. It was paved in 2015. Um, so, I mean, you'd have to get through 2020 for it to be uh, five years or, or older. I mean, we're not completely through the five year process right now. So that's why this request was put in. When, okay, when's, yeah. the, when's that five year mark? Uh, it doesn't have a month, Councillor, but if it was in 2015, it was at some point uh, in 2015, which was four years and X yep. amount of months ago. So we'd have to run through the course of 2020 before we'd get to the point where the five-year mark was actually met. Then it's done. So we're potentially at the, the couple more weeks at the four-and-a-half-year mark, essentially, if you look at it on a 12-month basis. Correct. Okay. Um, and it looks like they're going, they want the cut to be, because it's, um, eight oh, it's 811 Plymouth Avenue is the pet shop that I understand he's the owner of 807, which is in the back of his parking lot. So it's my understanding what they want to do is go through the, his parking lot to put this, to install um, this as opposed to the way it was done before, which had to go through a Butters properties. Correct. Okay. That is correct. Okay, with that, I yield for now. Any other questions? John. Yes, Councilor. How much digging up are they going to do uh, to, to the streets? Uh, it says uh, a second street between Morgan and Plymouth Avenue. Are we cutting up like uh, both sides of the street? <clears throat> so second street between Morgan and Plymouth Avenue, there are actually two services going in. Water's going in on one side. Uh, gas is going on on the other. So what we're actually working with Liberty and uh, Paul Freeland as we speak to try to get a, a, a proposal together where instead of doing those two eight foot from the curb in toward the center line repairs, we're gonna try to join together at the middle. So we'll have a complete mill and overlay on that street as opposed to having two trenches running up on either side where basically you'd have two tires on new asphalt, two tires on old asphalt. As opposed to doing it that way and having a patch run that entire length, we'd like to see the street get done from curb to curb, milled and overlaid. So we're working on that now. So we're crossing both sides of the avenue? We're crossing, it's going to be both sides of Second Street. As far as this one on Plymouth Avenue, 807, it's only yeah. one side. That's one side. One side, yep. And it'll be a nine-foot patch once it's done. And what's... Uh... To get everything done, how long is it going to take? I mean, it's going to this. I'd have to check with the contractor counselor, but I mean, it's a fairly standard repair um, service, so I don't think it's it's anything that would take all that long. It should be uh, in and out done quickly. Who's the contractor? Uh, that's also another good question, counselor. I'm not sure who the contractor was on they, this they one. Do East uh, Main Street? 
No. <laughs> no, come on. no, I'm just asking. That's all. No, it's not. It's not. It's not the contractor from East Main Street. I can tell you that much. Um, okay. Let's see if I have it here. Yeah, it doesn't list the contractor in the request. All I right, apologize. Uh, I don't have that answer for you. Colin. Uh, not, are they putting? The, yeah, they're putting the house on eight oh seven, right? Uh, it's, it's actually a service going to the one that's already in the back. All right, because I see the flags there in an empty lot, so. Yeah. Is that 807? The empty yeah. lot? Um, no, I think that's a house <laughs> in the back behind, as Councilor Vion had mentioned, yeah. behind the pet shop. Okay. Councilor right. Vion? Oh, I'm sorry. I have no problem uh, with that, so, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I make a motion uh, uh, to grant uh, the request to open up the street. I would second uh, that motion. Whoops. Okay, there was, there was a motion made by Councillor uh, Pelletier, seconded by Councillor uh, Dion. Uh, Councillor Dion, did, you had your hand up. Did you get your uh, question clarified, or were you going to clarify something? Oh, uh, yeah, I was going to uh, just clarify that, that, yes, it is absolutely that, how the Looks like a two family, I believe, in the back. But um, is it standard that you don't know the contractor prior to the work being done when it's only an application? No, no, for we, we, we would normally know who the contractor is. I just personally don't have that information right now. I can easily get that. Um, but it would be a bonded um, drain layer that is, uh, is, is bonded and, and licensed to work within the city. I'm just not sure which one it is at this point, and I apologize. Okay, that's fine. That's all I want to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, John, just, just a question with regards to the document we received from the city engineer, mm -hmm. uh, the engineering the division recommended the approval, uh, based on the following requests and conditions for the pavement restoration on the streets and goes from items one through 13. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first one was saying that the work is intended to be executed use, using trench, trenchless technology. Mm -hmm. Um, so were they, were they trenching, were they going underneath from the parking lot? So is there not? So would that suggest that there is not going to be a, a cut in the road? There'll be a cut and there'll be a cut in the road. Um, but then once they get to the property line, they're going to bore underneath. So there shouldn't be a trench going through. Maybe when we get to the sidewalk, they'll start that boring under the sidewalk from there. Trench the so technology. They, okay. So, so they have a road opening to where the pipe is. Correct. And then they bore from there or? From the, from the sidewalk in to in. the property yep. okay okay uh so councilors would you want to uh just amend the motion to include the 13 items that were listed by the engineering um department for conditions of approval that they have to meet i make a motion I'll second it uh so the amendment was made by council Peltier, seconded by uh council dion on the amendment all those uh roll call madam clerk on the amendment council dion yes council Peltier. Yes. Chairman Kadeem. Yes. Now so on, on approval the... as amended. Yes. Roll call, Madam Clark. Councilor Dion. Yes. Councilor Pelletier. Yes. Chairman Kadeem. Yes. Item number three is a street opening request from the city engineer for pavement less than five years old at 56. Frederick Street, this was referred to committee October 22nd, 2019. Uh, Councilor Dion. Yeah, I have a few questions on this one. I did go to look at the property. Um, this street is only, I believe, from 2018. This house, according to Patriot Properties, has been there for quite some time. It said it was built in 1900. So my question is, did they have water before or did they have um or did they have a well that would be my first question my second question is uh, the road appears that it's been opened once because there's a patch there and then my third question is it's a two family and i know it has nothing to do with it but that has three electric meters so that's kind of <laughs> those are my <clears throat> first questions so uh, it did have water originally the service had to be replaced um the contractor went in uh, and tied in the sewer that was done first the water is what needs to be done now 
Uh, so they need to go back in to do that as well. Um, secondly, there's another lot on the side of it. If you've been there, Councilor, you see, if you're looking at the house from the street on the left of the house, there's another lot where there is going to be another house built. Now that house may be a two family. I'm not sure. It might be a duplex type style. That might be why there's the three um, <laughs> meters, but there would have to be at least two um, because they are going to build another house. So they're going to have to go in again and do that. Um, but we've spoken to the contractor and he's aware that he's going to have to do a complete mill and overlay from that vacant lot where the house is going to be. Once that service is done, he's going to have to do from that location to the intersection of Bronson uh, in order to make these repairs up to par. Street's only two years old. So uh, we wanted to make sure that he followed through with that and, and did the repairs the right way. So what is the anticipated date to start building a second house there? And if that's in less than five years, will that require opening a, another street opening or are they going to be able to join it on the same property um, inside the property as opposed to opening the street again? Right. So I would look to, I mean, I, I know that they're really, really anxious to get this project going uh, and get it finished up. So I would think that that, that second service would be put in, um, fairly re fairly soon um i would suggest that we do that you know immediately uh, while he does this one do both and then we can overlay the road the service will be there ready for whenever the house is built i don't think we should wait for the house to be built and then do the service because then we're revisiting this again um, right i agree he would do that both services now then we would mill and overlay the street up to the intersection of bronze Okay, that's good. That, that was kind of the lines I was following because I wouldn't have the appetite to open it a third time. Correct. Okay, with that, I yield. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Council Pelsey? They're building a new house, uh, Mr. Perry. Yes. There's a house that's there existing, Councilor. That mm -hmm. house has the currently has the sewer line tied in. Mm -hmm. yep. Water line is what needs to be tied in on the existing uh -huh. house. Yeah, and both water and sewer will have to be run for the new house that eventually will be. Yeah, no, it's good that we build new houses, but it's good that we make sure that the streets are in good shape, and that's your job to watch them, make sure they do the right job. That's why we're going to have to bring it back to the council. No, I don't want you that, council. You make sure you're all set. We're all set up there. Uh, me sweating, council. Okay, no problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm all set. Um, I, I make a motion to grant permission. With the uh, conditions as outlined by the engineering department as well? Absolutely. Okay. There was a oh. motion. Second. 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 There was a motion to uh, approve the street opening request with the recommendations uh, and conditions for the pavement restorations as outlined by the engineering department. Uh, that was made by Councilor Pelletier, seconded by Councilor Dion. Madam Clerk, we call the roll. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Councilor Dion. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have asked this before. And also, we're going to make sure that they're they're putting sewer and water for both properties now, as opposed to coming back later. Correct, Council. Okay. All right. Madam Clerk, we call the roll, please. Councilor Dion. Yes. Councilor Pelletier. Yes. Chairman Kadim. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Item number four, we have an order, uh, 1068 Slate Street, Fort River Mass, for the removal of 16 feet of curbing at 1068 Slate Street, uh, removal on Montop Street. This was referred to the committee on December 16th, 2019. Council Peltier? You know, I've been up there. Uh, evidently, um, you kind of come in late with the application, and... Uh, that's why we sent it to committee to find out what happened because you're not supposed to <laughs> put the driveway in or do the work before you get the permit. But uh, the work is all done. And I, I went over and talked to Phil and uh, I drove by there quite a few times in the daytime. It's not too bad at night. There's a little more cars up there. Uh, Phil seems to be, a uh, nice enough guy to, to let uh, some of the people that live in the area park on his property. I know he's got a big driveway in the front, uh, but uh, it would make it easier, I guess, for, for the people in the neighborhood because he's letting them park there at night. So uh, 
I, 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 I certainly will go along with, with giving the cure cut. Uh, I know the job is done, but we want to get the message out there. If you're going to cut the cure, make sure you get all your permits or we don't have to go through this. And uh, that's what it, that, that's why I went to the committee. So uh, I'm not going to fight this. I think it's a good thing for the neighborhood because of Phil uh, kind of uh, gets along and lets the people park there. So I, I think it's a win-win for everybody in there. And he just had a new business move in and uh, uh, it's going to work out, I think, pretty good. So I'm going to support this tonight. I yield. Thank you. Thank you, Council Pelts here. Uh, Council Dion? Yeah, I'm kind of on the other side of the coin on this one. Um, they do have access to all of their parking front, back, and side um, on the Slade Street side. I did speak to a couple of neighbors. One of the neighbors said that they do have difficulty at times parking in the neighborhood. It's very congested. And the unfortunate thing is in the wintertime when we have parking bans, that's the side of the street that people have to park on and that driveway would ultimately take away at least two parking spaces. And the neighbor kind of re related to me that that would make it significantly more difficult. And as it is, sometimes they have to park around the corner or on another street. Um, if they didn't have the access that they have, and if they didn't have as many parking spaces as they have, I wouldn't have an issue with it. But because they have full access, I feel like it's, uh, as. Council Pelletier stated it's more for convenience than it is for anything else. Um, and again, <clears throat> although I don't know who did the work, the work is completely done. The only thing that's stopping it at this point is a chain that's attached to two poles. Um, so that's basically my take on it. I yield. Uh, Ms. Kadeem? Yep. Is, is, Phil, is Phil on today? Yeah, he's, he's here. Yeah, oh. I see him. Yeah. Can I speak? Yep, you can, Phil. Yes, um, as far, um, I mean, like Leo said, since I took over that property, I, I revamped it. The neighborhood, I, I actually brought up everybody's value in their properties in that neighborhood. And I get, I was brought up in that neighborhood. I, I, I'm, I'm, I moved back to the South End and uh, I get along with all my neighbors. I let them park there, front sides, the businesses around there parking my lot and uh and i also allow and because of my building being there that seven spots on on montop street that they use they occupy and i and i i always offered my neighbors if there's ever an incident an, an issue they can come in and park i mean there's nobody in that neighborhood that does more for that neighborhood than i do I mean, I'm not trying to brag, but I do a lot. I clean the sidewalks, I clean the walkways. I mean, uh, I think it's a good thing. I need it because it's, an, it's easier to get in and out. <clears throat> and uh, I don't see an issue. I really don't. I mean, uh, I think it's a good thing. If I may, uh, many years ago, we sold that and uh, Philip bought it. And let me tell you, it was a wreck. He spent tons and tons of money in there, straightening it out, slowly and slowly rented it as he fixed it and rented it as he fixed it. He's got it pretty well up to snuff. Is it all rented out now, uh, Phil? Yes, it is. Yes. It is. But it took a while there. I know you've been at it at least 10 years, all the oh, money yeah. that you spent. And oh, uh, you're right. I, I think it helps the neighborhood. I think the value of the, 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 the neighbors went up. And I think you've done a good job there. And to say that I'm not going to give it to you, I'm going to give it to you. And you get along with, with your neighbors, and I never heard any complaints. Uh, the only complaint uh, you had is when I brought you in front of the council, but hey, we got to do what we got to do. So I'm 100% for it, and uh, I hope we can get it passed through. Because I don't want to have to go back up there, and dig it out, and put a curbstone in, because uh, you're helping out the neighbors, letting them park there. So that's the way I feel. But that I yield. Can I say one more thing? Can I say yes, one more thing? Go ahead, Ms. I mean, I did, I did, uh, I did apply for a permit. 
I, I gave the city one hundred twenty five dollars for the for a permit. It was in October, I, I think. In the beginning of October, I did I did pictures of. What happened was when I went there, when I went to the engineering department, there was nobody there at the time. There was a woman around that that, that office that sits to the right of it. She came around. She says, "Can I help you?" I says, "Yes, I like to. Um, I want to, I need a permit for a permit, uh, uh, a crib car. And I know under 16 feet, you don't need to go for a variance. So I did that. So I, she took my payment, $125. But I didn't know because it's the first time I've ever experienced this. If I needed to, if she was supposed to give me a permit, so I don't. All she did was give me a receipt. I paid for it. Then I think two, three weeks after that. I get a letter from the traffic department saying I have to go in front of traffic. I did that. When I went there, they said everything was okay, and it was okay with engineering. Uh, then about, I want to say maybe a month later, I got a letter saying I had to go in front of city council. But that's after, I mean, I had no idea what was transpiring there. So I just wanted to know that. But I did, I did pay $125 for a permit in the month of, I think it was October or, or the end of September. So I didn't do it. I, I did it legit, the right way. I just want you to know that. Mr. Perry? So just to um, address a couple of things, and I think Councillor um, Dion's point was just that we don't like to see things post approve. Um, we like to talk about them, vet them out, let the neighbors have their say as it's supposed to be. And in my research of this particular issue, I think there yes. were a couple of things that were maybe skewed, not done the right way or in the right order. Um, I don't think yes. Councillor Dion has necessarily an issue with Mr. Souza at all or anything he's done or not done for the neighborhood. I don't think that's a thing. And I don't want to speak for her and clarify that. Um, but all I can say from our end is there were some mistakes made um, and um, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're doing everything we can to make sure that we put best practices in place. As I spoke to Council of Pelletier at Nauseam about with East Main, we can't change what was done now. Uh, yes. We can just try to make sure that it's not repeated in the future. And I think that's the best we can do. Uh, Mr. Souza, from everybody I've spoken to, I haven't had a chance to meet him or speak to him myself, but everybody I've spoken to, he's been really amicable about the situation, willing to do whatever he needs to do uh, to make things right. Um, so, and I don't think Councillor Dion saying that we should rip it out and not allow him to have it. I think she's just merely speaking on the fact that we need to make sure that the proper protocols are followed. Um, and we are attempting to make sure that's happening in the engineering department every day. So that's all I wanted to say. Yes, I, I agree. Councillor Dion. Yeah, no, I obviously, I have nothing, uh, no animosity towards this gentleman at all. Um, and I'm, you know, he's been through the proper channels. That's great. I don't know if um, Mrs. Ferreira was involved in this. He said he went before traffic, so I'm assuming she was. Um, and if so, I'd like to have her input, if I may. This Hi, Col Hi, Colleen. <laughs> We're double. <laughs> um, yeah, it did come in front of the traffic board, but um, like Mr. Perry is saying, the curb cut had already been done because they were doing work on, on top and Slade, all new sidewalks were put in and all that. So by the time it came to us, um, the curb had already been done. Um, the traffic board members did go and visit. They found you know, no problem with it. And we had a letter from engineering that there was no issues and that's when it was approved through traffic to go into council. Also, can I just jump in for a second? Um, so I, I think Ms. Dion's concern and rightfully so, especially down on the south end, is the concern for obviously the parking during the winter, um, let alone even just during normal normal times. But when we have a parking ban on, it becomes very, very difficult, especially if you don't have off-street parking. Um, <clears throat> I know, I, I, I think one recommendation that I would have uh, that would probably help um, uh, Council Dion's concern is, is that if we can get an agreement by Mr. Souza during the uh, snowstorms and the parking events, if he could actually just, if he has a chain up now, if he could do that and allow the parking. but. The question I would ask for you is if that were the case uh, and the police go out, would we, is there a way to make sure that they, they don't get fined for parking in that driveway section uh, during those snowstorms? And then obviously oh, the, sec and then the second piece is, is that it, it's only as good as Mr. Souza allows us, right? Because there's nothing that we can, to, can do to mandate that. But 
Um, I mean, if he's willing to do that, um, just during obviously during parking bans to allow people to to park over there to gain two two additional spaces. If there's a parking ban and the cars are in the correct side, they don't get tagged uh, unless okay. Mr. Souza would call to complain. That's the only way they'd get tagged. So if we have a massive snowstorm, the cars are blocking the driveway. Um, we normally will not tag unless we get a complaint. Oh, so you don't you don't do it if it's driveway. So you you're not doing any tagging on driveways as long as it's on, the on right a side. particular situation like that on a business that's closed. Yeah. No, we do not. Okay. So I, I guess, uh, Mr. Souza, from from Council Dion's standpoint, her concern was was to that. Would you be amenable to if this gets approved to allow that? Obviously, just blocking that off to allow the additional two parking spots for the uh, during the snowstorm. Yeah, absolutely. And I also I've already offered uh, property owners in that area that once if we do get a snowstorm, the way I have, the way I I'll, I'm going to have it plowed. A couple of them could actually park in my lot. I mean, okay. I'm there to help the whole neighborhood. If I can do it, especially in a in a in a, in a uh, uh, st storm, I'll gladly do it. No problem. That's that's guaranteed. <clears throat> okay, Councilor Dion, does that does that help alleviate some of your concerns? Yes, it does. It does. It's a, it sounds a little bit more like a win-win now than before. So the neighborhood to, and and the business working together. Yeah, I would be good with that. Okay. Motion to grant 16 feet. Motion to grant was made by Councilor Pelletier. Second. Second. Second by Councilor Dion. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Chairman Kadeem? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Souza. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Item number five is the order for Robert Medeiros. Uh, 97 uh, Witter Street, for a Mass, for the removal of 19 feet of curbing at 97 Witter Street, uh, referred on May 5th, two, 2020. Uh, Council Dion? Yes, um, I went over there, I spoke with the gentleman, I looked at the property, and essentially he went through all the proper steps with planning, etc., he got all proper permitting to put up the garage. So essentially he has a paved area and then his garage, which is dirt. So he just, essentially it's to just extend the driveway, which would be the width of the garage. Um, if he were to park his vehicles on the street, he actually would take up more street space than his driveway is going to take up. Um, you know, he has the ability to put his trailer, his truck and his two vehicles there. And I don't think it's going to cause any uh, problems in the neighborhood. I don't. It's not going to take away any parking because, again, he could park his own vehicles on the street. So whether they're on the street or in a driveway, it's basically the same thing. Um, and in the wintertime, it's going to make things easier because all his vehicles will be off street parking. So it will be even easier for the people doing the plowing. Um, so I'm definitely uh, in favor of this. So with that, I yield. OK, uh, any other further discussion? Council Peltier? You know, it, uh, the guy went through all the motions to put a nice building up and, uh, you know, I guess there's a little friction between some of the neighbors and himself. Uh, and that's why it's in the committee. Uh, you know, I've been there, I checked it out, but again, I'd like to hear uh, the complaints from whoever don't want that driveway there. Uh, so is he on? Is he on board? Is uh, Mr. S Mr. or Mrs. Silva on? Is that? He was on a few minutes ago. Is that the Galaxy? Hello. Okay. Yep. Perfect. So uh, you're looking to oppose the uh, the item that was that's before us right now? Yes. Okay. Do you want to talk a little bit about it? Reasoning behind it? Yes, I mean, uh, Mr. Medeiros has quite a bit of frontage of it as, as, in his property as, my, as my, my parents do. You know, they both have the same thing, 90 by 90. The only issue that my parents have is even with what he currently has, and as you can see in the photo submitted, he still parks on the street. I mean, I think, you know, my parents' point of view is he's opening that up. You can see even before this was approved that it's like a parking lot, for, you know, like it's a mall or something over there. He has a lot of guests, and this is on a weekly basis. 
So, you know, if, if I want to go visit my parents or my sister want to go visit my parents or my mother comes home from going out to the grocery store, they automatically put a car there. So, I mean, how is that right? You know, for, for that go right along his property. One of them's got a fire hydrant on it, so that's already a law space as it is. I mean, you're going to have over 130 feet, say, that you can't park on that side of the road. And then come winter time, Mr. Medeiros has a plow. My parents have more than enough video footage backed up of him pushing all the snow out of his driveway against their fence and, and potentially almost knocked the fence down. So, I mean, where do we end this, draw this line with giving him, you know, nobody said boo to Mr. Medeiros. He's been granted everything he's wanted. Nobody opposed anything. And as you can see in the photos, when the house was built, it was supposed to be a minimum of two spaces. And you can see that driver can fit four cars that he made there. Never mind mentioning the 90 foot driveway that goes single car that goes front to back on the other side, on the left side of his house, if you look at those photos. So, I mean, how much more off street parking does he need? Carlos Peltier, you still have the phone. Is, is, uh, is Mr. Robert Medeiros here? Uh, Mr. Medeiros is on, yes. Mr. Medeiros, uh... If you get granted uh, the extra 19 feet, uh, are you still going to park cars in, in the street? Or is that enough for all your vehicles? I understand your daughter's got one, your wife's got one, you got the truck, and uh, so on and so forth. So would this satisfy you with the 19 feet? Possibly you won't be parking in the street, any vehicles? Yes, Councilor Pelletier. Actually, if there are ever vehicles normally parked in front of my house, it's my guests. And like I stated to you and Miss Dion, um, that young man who's speaking, who is also Joseph Silva, it's his son. He has a vehicle parked in front of his father's house, and he's had it there for over a week. And before that, he had his girlfriend or his wife's car parked in front of the house for three weeks so that no one would park in front of his father's house. So my only concern is I have guests, they park in front of my house in the legal spot that is left there. And when they took their photos and sent them to city council, they explained that I was leaving out that 16 foot driveway, which I clearly wasn't because that 16 foot driveway, as well as the 25 foot driveway made the total 41. All I'm asking for is to pave the additional spot in front of my garage so I could use it as a garage. All right. But again, uh, Will you be parking some of the vehicles on the street after you get the addition 19 feet? No, sir. My vehicles will not be on the street. My vehicles will be in the driveway. Well, that seems to be fair enough. Do you, you don't park across the street, do you, as a rule? As a rule, I normally don't. I did one time when there were people working here at the house, but I tried to leave them alone. I'm trying to distance myself from them as much as I can. It's kind of difficult when they're, you know, right across the street. But again, I, I, re I've parked across the street, I believe, once in the time I've been here. So how many, uh, how many cars are you going to park there, right? Uh, if you get permission for the 19 feet. If I get the 19 feet, I can easily park four vehicles across there, possibly five, and I still have the other driveway where I do park my truck and my trailer. So again, I'm asking for one spot, and I'm taking six vehicles off the street. Guaranteed, right? Guaranteed, yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, it's a tough situation when I guess some of the neighborhoods don't get along a little bit and there's a lot of tension. And we're here to try to square it away. I know that you spent a lot of money. You went through everything you had to do to get the building up and so on and so forth. And again, uh, uh, to say that we don't rent it to you and somebody parks there. Uh, I don't know what the law is. Uh, uh, maybe uh, the parking clerk and I mean, the uh, commissioner can uh, tell us what happens if we don't grant it and somebody blocks that entrance to his garage. Is that legal? Can you give him a ticket or not? Laura? Uh if there's if it's an entrance that he uses and someone blocks it yes we can if it prevents the vehicle from getting into that spot we can tag that vehicle even though it's not a legal <coughs> driveway correct well 
Well, you know, I, 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 I can't see not granting this tonight. I, I think it's for the good of the neighborhood, whether they think it or not. All his cars are going to be uh, parked on his property with the new driveway, and they shouldn't be any other problems, I hope. And then again, you know, if they do block it, then they can get a ticket. So I don't know if that's right or wrong, but whatever. I think the best thing is to do to grant it and uh, uh, let things go on. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll make a motion that we grant the 19, 19 feet of curb removal. Uh, there, there was a motion made by Council Pelletier. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Dion. Councilor Dion, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, make mention that uh, in this part of the city, this is theoretically a curb removal because there is no curb there. <laughs> uh, we don't have too much curbing in this part of the city. Um, we, have, we tend to have berms. But I also want to make mention that I believe that the gentleman that was opposing made mention of 103 feet. Um, the grass area in front of the home at that location is still going to, is going to remain. Um, from my understanding is the driveway is not going to go from property line to property line. It's going to have that section in the middle where there's still street parking. And so I would ask uh, through the chair to Mr. Medeiros, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. So we're not taking away any more parking uh, in terms of that area. And it's a total 41, but it's separated. Um, so yes, I, I'll second the motion and I'll yield. Okay, uh, and just the motion was made by Council Peltier, second by Council Dion. Just, and, and again, I understand we've got the two neighbors um, who obviously seem to have a little bit of attention, but I, I just do want to remind people that obviously uh, the right to park on the street is, is everybody's right, regardless if you live there or not. I mean, uh, we don't own all the parking spots, but I would just ask Mr. Medeiros, you know, I understand the, um, the difficulty with some of these streets where parking becomes very limited, that if you do use this, uh, or if you if this is granted that you try as best as possible to make sure that you know that the cars remain off off street uh just so that it frees up some of the parking spots for other neighbors that may not necessarily have <laughs> off street parking uh with that madam clerk will you please call the roll Councilor dion yes Councilor pelletier <laughs> he stepped away yes <laughs> i just stepped away I'm back. Are we voting? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Chairman Kadeem? Yes. Motion passes. All right. Item number six uh, is a resolution to discuss the safety hazard created by limited lighting on public streets. This was adopted January 14th of 2020. <laughs> Uh, um, Council Pelter, I know you've had some some questions. Do you want to you want to kick it off, or do you want to have yeah. uh, the is administration there, talk there? a little bit? Is I'm there? sorry, Linda, is she there? Linda, uh, I don't I don't see her. Okay, no, well, no. the whole thing is uh, I remember when we started with the LED lights, and it's going to be the best thing the city has ever had, and uh, it's going to be brighter and so on and so forth, and. It was all right. It was all right. And all of a sudden, uh, people are complaining that it's darker than usual and uh, what's going on. And I did get a call of uh, uh, Linda Pereira uh, just before uh, the last election, and I put it in for myself and her as well. Uh, we never talked about it, never brought it up. And, and the question is, I mean, what happened? I mean, we're supposed to have brighter lights and cheaper and, and everything else, and then all of a sudden, everything dims out. Uh, I'm just wondering if they have a dimmer that they can dim it or not dim it, and why are the lights not as bright as they used to be uh, when they first started? I mean, we go through this, and uh, we paid funds to get them up there and everything else, and uh, a lot of areas throughout the city are not satisfied. They're not satisfied. They complain about Bedford Street, uh, Pleasant Street. Well, they don't complain about East Main anymore. All brand new lights, they looks real good. But uh, it should be out throughout the city of Fall River 
with the LED lights, they got to be much brighter. And I think we ought to get uh, somebody down here that knows about the lights or put them in. And to answer the question, why is there not the lighting that we used to have? That's the question I got. And I think that's the question that Linda has as well. So we'd like to get a little more lighting here in the city of Fall River. So what's what's the way to go? I mean, should we bring these guys in? Uh, uh, am I right? Is Linda right? Are the people right in Fall River saying that the lights are not that bright? So uh, could you answer that, Mr. Gallagher or Mr. Perry? Uh, it's Mr. Gallagher. Um, and yes, uh, we have already uh, begun um, negotiations with uh, Creed Lighting, as well as Amoresco and Rexel. Uh, they, they, Rexel was the distributor who we bought the lights or who Amoresco bought the lights from. Creed is the manufacturer and Amoresco was the company that was under the energy management systems that we had hired to do um, some conservative on energy, LED lighting, rooftop units, solar panels, things of that nature. So back in July, we had started this because we had some complaints uh, of dim lighting. We uh, recently, uh, I'm gonna say right around January, we actually went out with um, Councilor Pereira with the engineers from Amoresco to show them what was going on. Uh, we've taken down a few lights with Bishop Electric and sent them back to Creed uh, they determined that um, there's either an optics problem or a driver problem. What they've agreed to so far is to give us kits to replace the driver and the optics. Right now, um, that was those kits came in uh, last Wednesday. Uh, Mr. Bishop Electric uh, put those kits in and uh, is currently putting up 20 of them to see um, how they're going to work. And right now we're in a settlement negotiations with Corporation Council, Creed, Amoresco, and Rexel. So yes, you are correct, the lights are dimming. There's a manufacturer defect to the lights and they're under warranty because we had a 10 year warranty. So they are under a warranty. So who's gonna pay Bishop to change them all? That's what we're negotiating right now. So right now they paid Bishop to change over the 20 kits, the lights, as well as um, driving around with the engineers, uh, picking out the lights and the issues that we've had. Um, right now, Creed has paid Bishop to do all of that work already. And now, like I said, with Corporation Council, we're in a settlement negotiations with them, uh, with Creed, Rexel, and Amoresco. Now, we're talking every single light in Florida? 5,200 5, lights, sir. 5,200 lights. 5,200 lights. Yep. And uh, how long did, did, did we have them lights up? Uh, going on six years. Going on six years with a 10 year guarantee. Well, it's good. Uh, it's good that uh, I, I think where you are gonna make some headway and I guess it's gonna cost them a bunch of monies, I would have to say, to bring it back to snuff. And how long before you think this gets settled? Well, this. The COVID-19 there kind of slowed us down. We were we had a pretty good uh, run going there with the engineers and the Amoresco and all of that. We actually had uh, President of uh, uh, Vice President of Creed come down. Chris Brown uh, actually met with us. Uh, Councilor Pereira, myself, uh, Corporation Council. Uh, we sat there and we negotiated and some of the things we started to discuss, which were these kits and stuff. Uh, they finally got the kits to us because there was a little slight delay in the factories with the COVID. We finally got that. Uh, we've put those in. They seem to be okay. There's a couple of questions we have of who's going to warranty if there was a pinch wire in there since we're replacing them that we're having Bishop Electric change them out. So them are some of the settlement negotiations we're trying to work on as well as trying to get another 10 year on warranty. And how long before you think this whole mess is well now that now that this the, the COVID and everything's starting to open up a little bit and stuff like that we're hoping to have something and again don't hold me to it but we're hoping to have something within the next couple of months to figure out what they're going to do for us their manufacturing plan is back to manufacturing where they weren't there for a while with lighting so now they're getting back online so hopefully we'll have something uh in concrete uh after the negotiations uh -huh. Mr. Gallagher, whether you know it or not, I did put a resolution in uh, 
some time ago, 219. And for you to say that uh, you went out with Linda to check this out and check this out, well, I'm a little disappointed because, you know, you should have called me as well. You know, I'm part of the uh, the guy who started this, uh, putting it in for Linda and having concerns, and then you cut me right out. So I felt a little slighted that that's happening. I mean, transparency is what we should be doing. And for me not to be on first base with you and Linda, I think it's a little bit disappointing to the counselor. So I'm hoping that things could get a little better, that you get the job done, that you get things right, that you get the company to make sure that we get our money's worth here in the city of Florida. That's all I want. Do it right, get it done. And if if it's covered, let's get the money. Let's do it right for the people of Florida. But that I yield. Councilor, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm sorry that you felt that way. Uh, I will make sure that you're in the loops on the emails and things like that, and, and anything that we're going to go going forward with negotiations and stuff that you're informed at uh, all times, as well as uh, Councilor Pereira, um, so that you're you're aware of where we uh, stand. Boy, I would appreciate that. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, Councilor Pelletier. Uh, Councilor Dion. Yes. Um, how much time do we have left on the warranty? Because I'm uh, thinking we're closer to the end than the beginning. Yeah, about four and a half years. Okay. All right. Because a year has already gone by since the resolution went in. So time goes by quickly. But okay, so four and a half years. That's a yeah, good time. And, and the manufacturer and all of all involved, all well aware of, of the issues. Like I said, they sent down two of their engineers from one from Oklahoma, uh, another one a little bit closer. Uh, they sent them down to take a look at uh, what we had, and they agree there's an issue. Now, is there a list? Because um, I'm thinking it's a large city that there's obviously street lights that people could have missed. Um, is there a list of streets? How did they determine the, the 5,200? It's, it's all 5,200 lights. It's all nope. the 49, the 49 watt lights. So there are 139s that are on some of your bigger or main drags. And then there is the smaller 49 lights. Um, them are the ones, them are the 5,200 lights. That's the entire city of ones that are going bad. Okay, so this wasn't a question of drive around and see which ones aren't working. It's, it's all, of all of them. Okay, thank you. With that, I yield. Thank you, Councilor. Before I recognize Councilor Pereira, who has joined us, um, just in terms of LEDs, when we first put these up, the LED lightings are dimmable, right? Yes, they were. They were. They are not dimmable. These lights, but the what was told to us that they were. This particular light, there's two types of this light. This is an XP light, and there's an XPS light. That light was dimmable. This light is not dimmable. So none of the uh, street lights that we have in the uh, city are dimmable with the new LED ones. That is correct. There is a dial on it to look like to, di to dim it down, but the dial doesn't work. It just is just a spinner because it, there's two types of the light. So when we asked that question, we were told that they were dimmable. And in fact, when you get into them, they are not dimmable. Okay, so the replacement, I guess, that we would be doing, are we looking at dimmable lights or are they giving us exactly what we have so they're not dimmable? They're looking at to giving us exactly what we have, but we could probably, again, in that settlement negotiation, we could look at that. We haven't had a lot of issues um with the lights with being too bright there had been a couple of houses that had asked residents um because the lights are on like a three decker and that light happens to be right in their bedroom window yep. there's been very little of those there's been a few but it, there's things that we could probably do or we could probably just change those particular heads um that may be a particular issue okay uh the other piece when you talk about the uh, negotiation portion of this um what what exactly are we no I know you talked a, a little bit about it, but can you elaborate a little bit more? What what exactly are we no negotiating and why? I mean, if, if we've if we've got if we've got fifty two hundred lights that seem to be all um, having an issue, right? So they malfunctioning or whatever whatever terminology you want to use. Why would we be negotiating with them in terms of? Well, some of the anything? negotiation the negotiation is um, obviously we want the full ten year warranty on them. The other thing is is that they want to replace the kits. I personally like to see that we get 5,200 new lights and put them up and not replace the kits that are inside of them. Um, Mr. Bishop is on the, the same uh, exact feeling, I believe, as uh, Councilor Pereira. 
Um, but one of their things is, is that they're willing to pay to have the kits replaced, but not pay to install the lights. So uh, to install the lighting uh, would be at our cost, and that's not acceptable to us. So that's kind of the negotiation right yeah, now. That's, that, and that's where I was going with it, because it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, so we, we've got faulty equipment that we had originally paid to, to have them installed, and now it's going to be on our our yeah, and that's and, that, that, and that's what we feel. We feel that that they should live up to their part of the bargain, and that all three companies should have a hand in this, and that they should replace our lights. Yep. Okay. And the only the only thing I would I would say is, I mean, if if the companies, you know, I, I know it's probably not in the best interest to just have the replacement, but if if they're gonna if they're willing to do the replacement and give us a ten year warranty, does it really matter to us as long as we got a ten year warranty? Um, you know, I, I mean, because if, if they're not willing to give us a 10 year warranty on the on the new items, then, you know, from my standpoint, I'd rather have a 10 year warranty on these on these lights. So if they do become an issue that we've got, we've got the ability to replace them for, within the next 10 years. So I would just ask that, you know, obviously, let's go for the brand new lights. I would agree with you that that's what we should get. Um, and I, and I, I think we would from a legal standpoint, I, I would I would think that we would have an argument if everything you're saying is, is accurate. Right. Because uh, it, it's obviously a, a product malfunction. Um, so number one, I think they should be paying for the installation and giving us brand new, uh, lights with the warranty for another 10 years. So that, that's just my take. I'll turn it over to, uh, Councilor Pereira who just joined us. You're mute, Linda. <laughs> okay. I think I unmuted. Yep. Let me tell you, first of all, to Councilor Pelletier, I said that if anybody came, I wanted to be notified. I wasn't notified. How I found out about it was through Hal Meyer from Amoresco. I contacted him myself to tell him about the problems we were having here in the city and that I wanted somebody to come down and tell us what to do. He called me the day of that the man that was supposed to come down to test the lights was stuck in the state of Washington or Colorado. They weren't coming down. I said, okay, I'd like to know next time they come down. I got a notice 20 minutes before and showed up at City Hall in the basement, and that man went with us. I was told I wanted to be on the email list for every email that went back and forth. That happened for about three, four weeks, then no more emails was I getting. Um, I think that this committee should hold this off and make sure that Brian Bishop comes in too, because the drivers on these are made by Phillips. And then the lighting is made by Creed. And Creed's trying to get away with doing what they need to do. And they want to pay Brian to put these up for a very low cost that Brian physically can't, you know, he can't put it up for that cost. So there's some negotiations that has to be made, I agree. But I think they should come to the table. And this should be a financial discussion. Because all of the lights in the city, we didn't pick, we didn't pick one street or another. Uh, we drove around the entire city to see. And there's certain lights, you know, it's supposed to be to 13 or 14. And there was some that were like at six. So that there was clearly a problem with them. I mean, Bedford Street was like a runway, you know, and for an airport, it was so bright. Now you can't see anything. And you know, now that the, the coronavirus has come in, you know, there's a little bit of a delay. But this has been already... Over a year, I mean, I was complaining about it before and finally reached out to Council Pelletier because I wasn't on the council and said, Leo, please put in a resolution. And he did. So just to think that you're not getting notified, I wasn't either. I don't know why and why things were held up that way. But I know that they're, they're not trying to give us the best that they can give us. You know, Creed is, is putting more on, on Phillips with the drivers and Phillips putting more on Creed. And I think it's time to call Hal Meyer again. He was very good to work with. But I think you need to have Brian Bishop and the whole team in at finance to see what can be done. That would be uh, my say so, because some of this information is not correct. With that, I yield. Thank you. If I may, I would have to agree with Linda. And, sure. you know, I, I got a couple of people that were complaining about the lights. And I talked to Mr. Bishop, and I said, listen, these lights here, no good, blah, blah. Can we do anything about it? And he went out, and he changed the lights. He changed the lights, and I appreciate that. Uh, but if it's happening there, it's happening all over the city of Fall River. 
I want to say and, something else. And uh, Gall Mr. Gallagher, uh, you had stated that uh, you were going to go back to the same lights. Are we going to get the same lights, Mr. Gallagher? They're going to be the same style of light or the same brand of light, but they're not going to, they're the new improved or updated version of their lights is what they're telling us. So whatever the problem was with the, they say, you know, it's the driver that's on Phillips and Phillips is like the light. That's why they were replacing the kit. They were doing the optic and the driver. If we get the new lights, it will have all of the new drivers and the new optics in them. Because when you look at their new light, it doesn't look like the light we have. It's got four lights instead of three. Well, the way you stated it, it was, well, we're going to get the same type of lights. But if it doesn't work, we don't need it. We need something different. If they're going to pay for it, they should pay for it. It's going to be something different. It's not going to be the same thing, right? No, it's 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 the light. Well, I, I, I think I think what he's saying is, is that it's a different model, right? So you get an yes. iPhone 10, they're going to give us an iPhone 11. That's good. Maybe. It's still an iPhone, but it's it's, right, the, yeah. it's the newer version. Okay, just checking. Now, hey, you. Councilor Pereira? I just think also that when people have a burnt out light bulb in front of their house, they call a certain number and then, you know, it goes to Mr. Gallagher, then it goes to Mr. Bishop. Why not just have it go directly to Mr. Bishop? Because he checks that every day and, you know, you're not holding up a week or two weeks or whatever or it a month. It and goes then to you Mr. have a whole bunch of people at the same time that you have to fix. I think that that would help with some of the lighting situations. Well, it, it, goes to Mr. it goes to Mr. Bishop right away. When I get them, I, I forward them to Mr. Bishop right away uh, on some that I may be able to fix ourselves, we try to do. But the thing of it is, is we have a tracking system. So this way here, by calling in the number, I have an email that's being sent to me and I have a, a tracking number. So I know how many lights were used throughout the year, how many how many calls I've gotten. The other thing of it is, is that I have a history of the lights because now I can go back and say, you know, there's some people say I've called 10 times. I go back and I only see one call and it did go forward to Mr. Bishop. So it was either something I missed or something he missed. But this way here, we have a log and it was able to give to uh, Creed and give to uh, Amoresco that we could show the log of the calls we've been getting. So it's nicer to have that 1-800 number to be able to trace and log all of the calls and all of the issues that we have. Um, while if they call him directly, uh, we have no, no record of it. So uh, he would have to be keeping the records for us. Right now we have the records because it's in an email. Well, and I think if you asked him to keep the records, he would keep the records. He's very efficient. Oh yes, he is say. He's very efficient. Yeah, and that way he gets them immediately um, because sometimes I know people have called in and they haven't gotten anybody to go there. Bishop hasn't showed up there for three weeks. And that's not like Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop has, he's very um, efficient. He's very efficient. He gets there. So I think maybe you need to work that out so that people aren't complaining about. When I had talked to you initially about this, Chris, you told me down on Whitefield Street that there was a light there and people thought it was too bright. And Mr. Bishop went to take that light down and the neighbors came out yelling they didn't want the light down. And you said you went and the light was dim. There was only a few of them dim. But then when we have that meeting with Creed and with Jack, uh, the, the kid from Phillips, and they said you couldn't even dim the light. So, you know, I mean, there, there's miscommunication on these lights. That's why I think it's, imp it's utterly important to get everybody to the table at once and figure this out. Because the longer we wait, right now we're in this, you know, summertime is approaching. Daylight savings is a little bit better. You know, so hopefully we can get this all done so that by the fall, uh, you know, and by the time the, the clocks change again, it starts getting dark, that we have these lights resolved. It's been way too long dealing with this. You just got to keep on them. Right. I mean, and that's what we've been doing. The, 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 the COVID kind of slowed us down a little bit because we were on a, on a good roll. As you know, you were in the meeting with, uh, myself and Alan and Creed and Amoresco that were there that day when we were in the conference room in the mayor's office. So we were kind of going in the in a, in a very good direction at that point, but then this all happened and kind of slowed us up a bit. But yes, I do agree. We definitely want to have these lights before the fall, before daylight savings changes back, because then it it, it is going to be a lot worse. So can I, can I make the recommendation? Uh, 
Thank you, Councilor. Uh, so can I make the recommendation to the uh, committee members that I, I think it would probably make more sense to still keep this in committee, um, let you go through the negotiations, come back with us if you can give us a timetable as to when you think the negotiations will com be complete. Um, then at that point, I think the committee can make a determination that if there is a financial impact, then we should refer it to FinCom um, Finance Committee and then just have uh, the Finance Committee start talking about the financial aspects of, of this project in itself. Um, if that makes sense, do you, can you give us a timeline when you think those negotiations would wrap up? So, Councillor, um, like I said, we had just got the kits in this past Wednesday that uh, Mr. Bishop was able to transfer over um, 20 lights uh, of the kits that they've sent us. He's since put those up, the 20 lights, um, and now because that is completed, uh, they've paid the bill for Bishop. We've completed the lights. Now that the negotiation is going to resume, uh, we did send out a letter uh, to Creed through Corporation Council um, asking them to respond to us so that we can get back to the table and figure out what we're going to do. So uh, I will talk with um, Corporation Council tomorrow, uh, see if we can't within the next couple of days get some answers from Creed or what we're going to do or what's at least going to start to transpire. And then what I'll do is when those emails start to come in, I will also give them to Councilor Pereira, uh, Councilor Pelletier, and if uh, Council President wants or yourself, I can send them to you as well or just the entire council. Uh, yeah, I, w I would just probably just to make it easy for you, just send it to the entire uh, council. council. And then I would just ask that obviously I know it's a it's a pain sometimes to include a bunch of counselors and, and doing these field sites and stuff like that. But I, I think the uh, the counselors who have been obviously active in trying to uh, make sure that these lights get situated, you know, Council Pereira, Councilor uh, Pelletier, if you can include them, um, you know, during the discussion or just let them know that conversations are going to be had if they if they want to be able to and, and the administration's OK with them just jumping in on the meeting uh, yeah forward. i was just going to say if we have any zoom meetings or anything like that i'll let them know beforehand and see if they want to get on a zoom meeting with us uh, yep. and see, uh whatever type of negotiations we're going through okay so uh if, if the committee is comfortable with this and i i see you raising your hand Lee, I'll, I'll give it back to you but uh maybe we should just revisit this in july uh we'll just put it on our, our schedule it's, it's may now like that give us uh, about two months uh, so if we just revisit it in July, see where you stand, because uh, obviously we'll be getting closer to the, uh, you know, daylight savings uh, with the fall. So that, that'll give us at least if we have to have another meeting in August before we start getting into the, uh, you know, September, October time frame, um, just so that we can make sure that we're ahead of this whole situation. Is, is everybody good with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Council Pelletier. Hey, Mr. Gallagher. Yes, sir. Can I get the list of the 20 polls that you care of yes sir okay and at this point i'd like to make a motion yeah uh, council before you make your motion can i can i suggest that we uh keep item six and then we just uh do item seven grant to lease to withdraw they're both essentially the same yeah well, same resolution table vote them. Uh, so just so we can get rid of one of them just to clean up the committee all right so we'll table uh number six no, no, table seven, because so, seven's been in the committee for a while. At least six is, uh, we've talked okay. about it. It's a little bit more recent. All right. So uh, make a motion to table number seven. Yep. You... Grant leave to withdraw. Oh, leave to withdraw. Okay. Yep. Uh, make a motion, uh, item number seven, leave to withdraw. A motion second. Was, motion was made by Council Pelletier, seconded by Council Dion. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? This would be on item number seven. Correct. Oh, we're on item number six. We are, but it, they're, they're one and the same. Um, so we were just going to table item number seven and then go back to six and make a motion. Okay, so item number seven, you're tabling or granting? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, grant to leaving to withdraw. Was okay, the item number seven, to grant leave to withdraw. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Chairman Kadim? Yes. Motion carries. And then Councilor uh, Council Pelletier, so item number six? Table. Motion and table? Second. Motion on the table was made by Councilor Pelletier, seconded by Councilor Dion for item number six. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? To table item number six, Councilor Dion. Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Chairman Kadeem? Yes. Motion carries. Madam, Madam Clerk, if you can just give us a reminder, or at least myself a reminder, to try to get this item back on for July. I will. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Item number eight is a resolution that the administration work with Oak Grove Cemetery to return historic and sacred items to their cemetery sites. This was adopted January 14th, 2020. 
Uh, Council Pelletier. You know, uh, things happen throughout the city, and it's good that we have somebody that's watching what's going on and the destruction of Oak Grove Cemetery and everything that's happening there uh, quite a while ago. And it's good that uh, we have somebody watching it, and it's good that uh, this is a good resolution to try to get resolved uh, for the people who have their loved ones up there and to have some of these things destroy is absolutely wrong. And to have a uh, council to try to correct it, I think it's the way to go. And uh, I, I give a kudos for that. And I'm certainly on board. I don't know what could be done or what we're gonna do, but it's a, it's a, it's a step in the right direction. So uh, good luck to Linda and I'm with you. Council Dion. Yeah, I, I agree with the uh, whole thought process. I'm a little curious to know how much of it is still available, if how much of it was preserved, um, and ultimately how much will be able to be returned and um, put back in its, its original state. Who wants with that, to, I yield. Yeah, who, want, who wants to take that question, Mr. Perry, Mr. Pirano? So um, it's a two-part question, I would say. Uh, Mr. Perano has the numbers. Um, I believe it's 165 uh, longer uh, rectangle-shaped uh, flower boxes, um, 16 round urns style, uh, and some other smaller rectangle uh, flower boxes. The problem is, Councillor, how much of it can we return to its, its original place? Um, that's a tougher question because, unfortunately, when it was removed, it was not cataloged. There was nothing tagged on any of them that would say, you know, this would be tagged on any number. Mr. Mr. Barry, can I ask you to hold on? Yeah, could, could, could it, I'm just going to mute everybody, if, if you don't mind. Um, and then I'll unmute you folks as we go along. All right, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, so there there wasn't a catalog done of exactly where and what grave sites these came from. So, I mean, we do have a significant amount of them that we can return or try to decipher where they came from. Um, some of them we could probably match up with other gravestones um, that w it, it would fit. It would be symmetrical. Um, we could, you know, put them in some of the older parts of the cemetery because a lot of them are older ones. We had at one point offered um, the public that was affected by this to come in, uh, try to identify their urns. And if they could, um, they could collect them. Uh, we didn't get a lot of takers on that. Uh, so the, the urns are currently stored at uh, the Bullock Street location we have at the cemetery. Um, they're organized, they're there. Um, and I mean, again, if we put it out to the public that they're, they're allowed to come down and try to identify which ones could possibly be theirs, um, we're more than willing to do that. Um, other than that, we'd have to work together and come up with some interesting ideas on how we could figure out uh, where they go and how to put them back. Um, so, but without a catalog of, of where they were moved from and where they need to go back to, it's going to be very difficult to identify their original spot. Unfortunately. So, so do you believe in reality that they're different enough that people can identify their own? That's the problem. Uh, most of them are kind of uh, cookie cutter. Um, you know, I think there's, there weren't a lot of, uh, some of them are older. Um, so I don't think there were a lot of companies that were making them that back then. So a lot of the people probably got them from the same vendor. Um, so it's tough to, to, to decipher where they came from. They don't have names on them. Some of, most of them have the same kind of style to them, same design on them. Uh, so it's going to be difficult, Councilor. It will be a challenge. Um, but, I mean, again, we can go back and look and say, you know what, we know some of the areas in the cemetery that had a lot of them, and we can try to identify stones that actually have, you know, may have been worn out in front of the stone where you could see at one point there was a flower box there, a flower urn there, um, and, and try to put it back in those places. Most of them came from areas where, um, you know, the, the graves are quite old, so there may not be any surviving relatives. Um, so we'd have to um, put them back as best we could. Uh, again, we offered up to the public to come in and try to identify them, but we didn't get a lot of takers on that. We did get a few people come down and look and try to identify. 
Um, you know, if we had 10 of the same style urn and the, the resident said, yeah, you know, those, I had two of them that looked just like that. We, we gave them those two, um, because obviously they're cookie cutter. Um, but outside of that, it'd be tough to, 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 to figure out where they actually came from. So when you say you gave them to them, so at that point, it, was it their responsibility to put them back? Or? They weren't allowed to be putting them back at that point. There had been no decision to be able to put them back. Uh, but if they wanted to come collect them, okay. um, they, they had been notified that they were removed or they found out through the media that they had been removed. If they wanted to come and get them and that way they could take them and have them since they did pay for them at some point, um, they were allowed to do that. But again, there weren't that many, unfortunately. Um, a lot of the graves that they came from were older and uh, the families have since passed on. Right. So at this point, we'd be taking a second step and actually returning them to the grave sites. Correct. So people would be able to bring them and the city would put them back in place? Well, if that's if that's the direction we decide to go uh, or the council council decides to go, we would work together with the council and and, and try to figure out the best way to do this. Um, I would only caution one thing uh, that we have had some issues with the newer graves uh, and what people are putting there. So we've put some stipulations and some some criteria in place for what's allowed and what isn't size of the box, width of the box, depth of the box, things of that nature. Um, so if we're going to start allowing people to put them, uh, we just want to make sure that they follow these these rules. Um, the urns that we currently have um, put aside, I would say those are more, in a sense, if we were to return them, it would be more of an effort to return the cemetery back to what it originally was as far as having those urns on those older style grave monuments. Um, so it would be merely aesthetic. Um, so it would be a gravestone that had an urn at one point that that urn's re being returned to. Um, and the other thing that I know was an issue, um, years ago, those urns were filled with flowers and people would come, you know, every year um, in springtime, plant new flowers, they would take care of them, they would maintain them. Over the years, that practice kind of fell off the wayside. So it, it did become an issue trying to maintain, cut, and, um, you know, uh, keep those boxes up. So and I'm not saying that's the reason they were removed. I'm just saying that that's a byproduct. So if people are going to put flower boxes, we'd like to make sure that they try to maintain them as well. Okay, with that, I yield. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Counselor. Uh, to Mr. Perry and Mr. Perano, in terms, in terms of all these coming back, I mean, had, What's the conversations been with the uh, park board in terms of the cemetery and all these items? So I, I think part of the discussion has been um, looking generally at our rules. Um, and I've been working with members of the park board to propose new rules and regulations that, you know, kind of expand on what we have and make things more clear, as well as address the areas um, of maintenance. So, so there is some maintenance issues with, um, you know, the stuff uh, people adorn their graves with as well as, um, you know, if these uh, flower boxes do come back, like Mr. Perry said, there are some maintenance issues that, that you know, get coupled with bringing them back. Um, and how the park board and, um, you know, the maintenance staff at the cemetery would deal with those issues um, moving forward. So, um, you know, if, if the council wants to move forward with this, I think part of the discussion with the park board would be um, incorporate, incorporating that into the new rules that we're working on as far as saying, you know, they can come back, but families are going to be asked to maintain them in, in some type of fashion where they're not growing weeds or, you know, breeding ground for mosquitoes or, you know, poison ivy and the things of, of that nature in the cemetery. Okay. Um, so, and, and once you have those conversations, I guess what I, what I would like to see is, is that maybe um, you folks, Mr. Perry and Mr. Prana, go back to the park board, have those conversations, and then come back to this board to see you know, just be the liaison between uh, the park board and, and us and just figure out uh, what they're comfortable with. Um, one, one thing I think we're trying to look for is, is if, if we can't, I, I think we would all agree that if we have historic items there um, and we can't ident identify them, then, you know, I, I think it would be nice to get them somewhere in the cemetery. Now, where exactly, obviously, we'd, we'd leave that up to the, you, you know, you folks and, and, and the uh, park board to figure that out. But if you can come up with some type of plan, but I would agree with you that some of the some of the items that may not be historic in nature, that obviously there needs to be some type of 
uh, guidelines as to you know what what's allowable at the at the cemetery just for maintenance purpose you know obviously to 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 ease you know the grass cutting things of that nature and and the upkeep of of the cemetery but um you know if, if the committee members are in agreement with that i'd I like to see you folks just go back uh and just kind of have those uh strategic conversations with the park board and then come back to this committee if if possible that works council yeah committee so members, are you are, are you council dion yeah so at this point uh we would make a motion to refer it back to the park board and table it for it to come back to committee well i i don't think we need i, I think we would just table it and just uh task you know mr perry and mr Prana to go back to the uh to the park board uh and if you if, are they meeting regularly <clears throat> the uh first scheduled meeting that they're proposing to have uh chris and i spoke about this today are uh, they looking to have a meeting in june um, okay so that'd be the first wednesday of june so if maybe if you can get that on there maybe we can get this back on the agenda for july so we can uh, we, have, take... we have a few pressing issues that are going to be on that agenda i'm not sure how big it's going to be but we will definitely talk to uh the chair of the park board and see if that's something that we can get on there okay and then, i mean if the agenda is too heavy then even if you got to push it off to the maybe august it, meeting consular honestly in my history with this particular issue i think it's going to be a little bit longer of a conversation so maybe july would, would be more realistic that would give us more time to vet it out with the, uh, with the board and yep. get their input and see what their feelings are and again as you said if we can't get them back to their original places um, that'll give us some more time to actually figure out what we can do with them to put them somewhere in the cemetery that'll serve a purpose and um, make them look nice. Maybe something up around our new columbarium area or something along those lines. Yeah, that, that's fine with me. I just I just want to be able to, as we table these items, really kind of have just a benchmark as to when we're going to have these conversations because, you know, as, as committee members, we, we often get criticized for not, you know, addressing some of these issues and letting them linger. So uh, I, I would be comfortable if the board members are in agreement, then we'll just uh, bring this back up in September that give you at least this summer to really kind of have those lengthy conversations with the park board and come up with a plan and just bring it back before this uh, this committee yeah absolutely and to address your concern as far as what you know the impression of the committee is uh, Chris has been great and he's very proactive about stuff like this so um, uh, once he gets on it um, he'll he'll stick with it and we'll come up with something from the park board and get a solution in place and then we can discuss it again yeah, no problem. That, that comment was directed towards uh, no, I understand myself, my, my, myself, Michelle, and Leo. <laughs> no, I got you. I got you. And, and not not us three in particular, just just us as counselors. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So, all right. Uh, it, it, I would make Dion, the motion to table. Motion to table was made by Councilor Dion. Seconded by Councilor Peltier. Even though he's muted, I can see him. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? Oh, I got you on. Don't worry. Oh. I'm on. All right. I'm good, huh? You're good. <laughs> oh, you're, you're muted too. I'm sorry. Everybody's muted. I muted everybody. That's what happens when you let me drive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Chairman Kadeem? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. And, and Madam Clerk, if you could just highlight this one for a September okay. meeting. Thank you. Uh, lastly is item number nine. It's the minutes for June 12, 2019. Motion adopt. Motion adopt was made by Council Pelletier. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilor Dion. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? On approval of the minutes, Councilor Dion? Yes. Council Pelletier? Yes. Chairman Kadeem? Yes. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion, motion to adjourn. Motion was made by Council Pelletier, seconded by Councilor Dion. Madam yep. Clerk, call the roll. On adjournment at 620, Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Chairman Kadeem? Yes. We Thank you, again. folks. All right, Councillors. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day.